Welcome to Accessible Art History, the podcast, the best place for art history lovers or anyone that is curious. My name is Annalisa, and I'm going to be sharing an amazing archaeological discovery with you today. Just a quick reminder before the episode starts, all sources and images will be posted on the Accessible Art History blog. You can find the link in the episode description as well as on Instagram at accessible.art.history. Now that we have that out of the way, let's get started. After a long hiatus, season 12 is officially back. Thank you for your understanding. I was student teaching and I had to devote 100% of my time and energy to my future career. But things are winding down and I finally have the time to pick up my content creation again. So to continue on with our exploration of archaeological finds, I'm going to focus on the discovery of the Staffordshire Horde. It's the largest horde of Anglo-Saxon gold and silver metalwork ever discovered. Dating from around 650 to 675 CE, the Horde has some amazing pieces that that have taught art historians and archaeologists a plethora about the early medieval period in the British Isles. I can't wait to explore it with you. One last note before we get started, thank you to the Provincia family for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Your support means the world. Now, let's dive into the episode. On July 5th, 2009, Terry Herbert, a member of the Blockwich Research and Metal Detecting Club, was sweeping an area near Hammerwich, Staffordshire. The farmland had recently been plowed, so it was prime hunting space. Suddenly, his metal detector went off, indicating that he had struck gold. <laughs> Quite literally. Over the next five days, 244 objects were moved from the soil. It was at this point that Herbert contacted local archaeological authorities. They also contacted the farm owner, Fred Johnson, who granted permissions for excavations to proceed. For the next several months, a secret dig took place. The initial artifacts and geological surveys indicated that this was a large find, and everyone involved wanted to protect it against looting. During the first excavation, just over a thousand objects were discovered. Most of them were quite small, but there were about 10 large pieces found. In September 2009, the find was officially announced to the public. It was an immediate sensation. The Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery displayed a few of the pieces that had been conserved, attracting tens of thousands of curious onlookers. The find was declared a national treasure, therefore making it property of the crown. Over the next couple of years, additional digs took place at the site. In total, about 4,600 objects were discovered. This is absolutely incredible and would provide a rare opportunity to study the Anglo-Saxon culture. Unfortunately, if I tried to cover all the artifacts, this episode would be a week long. But I did pick a few of the highlights to show you just how incredible the find is. And don't forget, you can see everything I talk about over on the blog. Firstly, a few Christian religious objects were found. These include a few crosses, an inscribed golden strip with a biblical story, and a, quote, mystery object. This is particularly incredible to me because it shows just how far Christianity had spread in the few centuries since it became a legal religion in the 4th century CE. It can also tell us a lot about the religious practices of the Anglo-Saxon people. One of the most spectacular finds from the Staffordshire Horde was a helmet. It is clear that it was destroyed prior to being buried, but we're not sure why. Experts were able to reconstruct this piece, and it's truly magnificent. There are small scenes pressed into every part, including knots, people, and designs. Interestingly, it has a similar appearance to another famous helmet, the Sutton Hoo helmet. There's no indication about the owner of the helmet, but it's clear that they were important from the beauty and intricacy of the piece. Another amazing find was the quote, fish and eagle plaque. Although it's twisted now, it was once a straight piece with symmetrical images of an eagle swooping down and catching a fish. This was a common motif of power in the early medieval period, and historians theorize that it was once used as a decoration on the saddle of a member of the nobility or royalty. These are only three of the magnificent objects from the Staffordshire Horde. On the blog, I've linked the main website for the Horde so you can view the incredible high-resolution photos of the find. I highly recommend checking it out because they have a zoom feature that allows you to see all the intricate details. Next, we're going to examine more about the people that made these amazing objects. But first, let's take a quick break. Hey everyone. I wanted to take a quick break to tell you about what software I use to bring Accessible Art History, the podcast, to life. It's called Anchor, and it's truly made a difference in my mission of making art history fun and easy to learn about. Although I'd always thought about adding a podcast to my content creation, the thought scared me. I'm not an audio engineer or a tech guru, but Anchor makes it so easy. You can use their website or app to record, edit, and spice up your audio with music. 
They partner with you to make your podcast a success. Not only do they take care of distributing it to all the major platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, but they even match you up with sponsors with no minimum listenership required. It makes creating a podcast easier than I honestly thought possible. But the best part? It's absolutely free to use. As someone who is in the beginning stages of content creation, I'm so thankful to have a free platform that helps me create a quality podcast. If you want to get started on your own podcast, simply go to anchor.fm, that's A-N-C-H-O-R-F-M, or download their app on your preferred app store. Thanks so much for listening. Hi there, my name is Annalisa, and I'm the founder of Accessible Art History. My goal is to bring art history content to anyone that is curious. All my platforms can be accessed for free, but there are ways that you can support the cause. If you enjoy this episode, please consider leaving a rate and review on your favorite platform. I also have a Patreon and a Buy Me a Coffee account set up if you feel inclined to support accessible art history monetarily. However, I will always work to bring content for free because I believe that education should be accessible for those who want and need it. Thank you for listening, and now let's get back to the episode. All right, now that we're back, let's take a look at who buried the Staffordshire Horde. The location of the site itself was remote, even in the 7th century CE. This likely means that the person, or people who buried it, knew they wouldn't be able to come back for a long time, or that it was a part of some sort of ritual. Regardless, it was clear that this hoard was meant to remain hidden for generations to come. The craftsmanship of these pieces is absolutely extraordinary. The amount of skill needed to manipulate the gold, silver, and jewels would have taken years to perfect. In addition, the material itself was of very high quality. This means only a person of wealth and status could have afforded to not only have the pieces made, but then have them buried in the ground later. Finally, it was nearly certain that these objects were created by a man. Finally, it is nearly certain that these objects were created for a man. Unlike many Anglo-Saxon hordes, there are no objects that are related to things needed by a woman, like cooking vessels or feminine jewelry. Another crucial detail is the amount of martial items, particularly the helmet and the sword pommels. Some experts have theorized that these items were buried by a king or ruler during the Viking attacks of the 9th century CE. However, there is no conclusive evidence, so we can't really say for sure. Regardless, it's a magnificent hoard that we have learned so much from. As I just mentioned in the last segment, the materials of the hoard deserve an explanation of their own. In total, the hoard contained 5.1 kilograms or 11.2 pounds of gold and 1.4 kilograms or 3.2 pounds of silver with 3,500 claws and agar nets. Analysis of the metals indicate that their composition matches that of Byzantine coins of the period. Fascinatingly, the garnets from 28 pieces of the hoard came from as far away as Sri Lanka and Afghanistan, likely through trade during the Roman period. These facts show us just how far trade went during the medieval period, from coins from the Byzantine Empire and gems from as far away as Sri Lanka to make their way all the way over to the British Isles is simply incredible. It just goes to show that the world was far more connected back then than we originally thought. As I mentioned earlier in the podcast, the Staffordshire Hoard was declared a national treasure and then became property of the Crown. Under the Treasure Act of 1996, however, a reward for finding the treasure can be established at market price. This money is then split between the finder and the property owner. After the hoard was sorted and sent for conservation, it was jointly purchased by the Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery and the Potteries Museum and Art Gallery for 3.3 million pounds or about 4 million US dollars. The purchase price was raised by the public and through a humanities grant. Today, the Staffordshire Hoard is on display at these two museums, with selected pieces allowed to travel for special exhibits at places like the British Museum. The Staffordshire Hoard is one of the most important finds in archaeological history. Its large size and intricate details make it a literal treasure trove to understanding Anglo-Saxon culture. And make sure to tune in next week when I discuss the amazing Buddhist temple of Bora Bador. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Accessible Art History, the podcast. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at accessible.art.history and keep an eye out for the next episode. They drop every Monday on your favorite podcast platform. If you prefer to listen on YouTube, episodes will start being uploaded in a few weeks, so subscribe there too.